Welcome to No Raw Standard Thread, live tweet analysis in C++. Uh, my name is Kirk Shoup, and uh, this is what I do in my spare time. Uh, this is an example of a marble diagram, which helps us uh, describe the inputs and outputs from algorithms for values distributed in time. So you can see that there's an input timeline where values are distributed and an output timeline where values are distributed. These are live diagrams and the URL at the bottom will bring up these slides so you can play with them yourself. So if I move this out for appears because debounce has been given a millisecond value that will ignore uh, values if another value is available within its timeout. And otherwise, we'll ignore them. I mean, we'll ignore them too. So we've been watching uh, this for a little while. Whoops. The cursor has to be here. This is the app that I built uh, using these algorithms. I saw a talk by uh, Neil Connaughton, who did something uh, with a little less uh, in it than this uh, in RxJS for a talk, and it inspired me. I wanted to build the same thing. This is monitoring a sample of all English tweets from Twitter live. And their sampling algorithm seems to be pretty good. I seem to get a fairly good representation of the trends that are going on. Uh, I've watched it during uh, voting periods and game shows or whatever. And you can see the hashtags that are trending uh, and kind of predict who's going to win. I find this completely mesmerizing, as perhaps <laughs> all you have as well. There is so much data here that and some of it is very surprising. Like once I filtered out all of the non-meaningful words, love has for months that I've been running this almost always been at the very top. There's hardly anything that ever beats it. And it's sentiment, the sentiment of the tweets that love is included in are eight to 10 times more likely to be positive than negative. That may not be entirely surprising. But hate is never in this list, never even in the top 10, <clears throat> which I find an interesting comment on humanity. Whoops. <coughs> it's easy not to get that feeling when reading Twitter, though. Exactly, <laughs> which is why this is so interesting, because you get an entirely different view. So for the last 20 minutes, the most negatively, uh, the, the most commonly uh, used word in a negative tweet has been Trump. <laughs> but if you'll notice, it's only 1.1 times more negative in, in more, sorry. It's only in negative tweets 1.1 times more often than it is in positive tweets. So it's nearly 50-50. It's just he was the one most likely to be mentioned in a negative tweet but still he's also nearly the most likely, other than love, to be mentioned in a positive one. Yeah. Uh, here's a word that I find very interesting. Wanna is almost always negative. The tweet that it's used in is almost always negative. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's an indicator, at least for the algorithm I'm using for det determine uh, sentiment of negative sentiment, which I found surprising. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for now. I think everyone understands what kind of information you get here. So we're going to go through some topics. Uh, we're going to pick the pattern that we use for asynchrony. 
We're going to talk about uh, the pattern that is used by the underlying algorithm set. And then we're going to show how it was used to build the application. So I love watching these videos. I'd love to build things this way, but seeing the calluses and blisters and the time it takes to do these things, it's just so inefficient. <laughs> and the same thing applies to, you know, some of our technologies like standard thread and mutex and condition variable and atomic. They're so attractive to play with and use and so painful. So Sean Parent gave a talk. Uh, I actually was able to go to this talk in 2013, C++ seasoning. And he uh, spent a good portion of the time talking about the goal of uh, removing all the for loops in your code and replacing them with calls to algorithms. And how he had a particular code example where you could just Part, uh, look at the body of the for loop and figure out, oh, it's this algorithm and then it's this algorithm and reduce it to that. At the end of that, he also uh, mentioned another goal, which was to not use async primitives. So even back then, uh, the, that conversation had started. So the goal here is to avoid re-implementing concurrent algorithms, just like we sh should avoid re-implementing re the existing standard algorithms, and to avoid using synchronization primitives. So handling tweets, they're arriving in time. And you could handle them with callbacks. But I'm not exactly sure how many of those pins actually make it all the way through to the USB stick. And I'm sure it doesn't work very well. But there's definitely a whole bunch of data loss. And that's the primary problem I have with callbacks is it's not really a surface that is a good set of, that has a good set of concepts around it that you can build algorithms around. So there's nothing, I couldn't build a generic filter that I could just pass into any callback as the implementation of any callback and chain off of. It's just, it's not composable. It's not, you wire it up man manually each time and you always lose data. Maybe you'll forget to handle the error or maybe there is no error available or maybe some other signal like completion isn't available. It's, it's fraught with uh, difficulty if you actually want to build algorithms on that abstraction. Or you could do a promise per tweet where there's this pretty crazy little dance whenever you want to pass off a value from one algorithm to the other, from one promise to the next. And you have to do this crazy mutex synchronization dance to find and grab the value from the previous guy and pass it on. So on my Mac, I have a unit test in my, or a perf test in, in my library that will run through promises, about 10 million of them. And it takes about three seconds, and I would only be able to transfer about three million values. And the problem here is that I'm setting up this expensive async state per value. Or I could deal with it more like a subscription, where I deal with that overhead of creating a async uh, state once, and then I just call, pass all my values through that one asynchronous uh, lifetime, that one asynchronous state. And so passing the 10 million values through, it takes about 17 milliseconds. So I actually did uh, last week 
try to sit down and rewrite uh, kind of the core of getting the stream of tweets and parsing it and getting a little bit of uh, information out of it, like splitting up the words. And to do that without uh, any algorithms. And so, or any concurrent algorithms, async algorithms. And so I ended up with something where I was passing in my multicast handler array and then iterating over it to call back with the parsed uh, uh, words and text of the tweet. And I built uh, an each function that operates pretty much like for await will when it's in the standard and built uh, an object that had a begin end. So begin returns a promise and plus plus on the begin on the iterator returned returns a promise. <clears throat> and then each is this nasty little thing that tries to transfer from one promise to the next and wait for the next one and then run the body for each of the promises that arrive using dot then. And still it feels like you're rewriting a whole bunch of algorithms here, even when you're doing promises. And you have all of that overhead. So this actually does a lot more than uh, both of the previous slides combined in an algorithm set. So you can sign the URL, create an HTTP request, retrieve only the chunks from the body. And underneath that HTTP uh, create is actually libcurl. I wrapped it up before I was in the networking TS this week and wrapped it up, wrapped that up in uh, Rx. I had already wrapped up libcurl. So <clears throat> once I have the chunks coming out, I can pass them through a operator that I define in this app that does that implements the reconnection protocol. So if you reconnect to a stream too quickly on Twitter, it will uh, throttle you, it'll shut you down, it will refuse connection. And so this implements their entire policy of for this error you have to wait this long before you reconnect and for that error wait this long and it implements all that. And the reason it's able to implement that is that once a failure does occur and it waits the appropriate time, it can just repeat what's above it, which includes that defer, which will re-sign the URL, restart the HTTP request. But all the logic for actually figuring out when to do that is entirely within that stream reconnection operator. And then similar thing for parsing tweets. And then uh, the publish ref count idiom is for allowing more than one uh, interested party to use the same source of tweets and pull different data from each. Like each of them is focused on pulling one thing out of the stream of tweets. And so you could see in the app that there were lots of different windows producing data in different formats uh, with different um, intents. And all of those can be individual expressions unrelated to each other. So you can just comment one out and that data source goes away, but the rest of the app works fine. So, I didn't understand what defer does. Great, so defer is something uh, that we'll talk about later called um, virtual, uh, sorry, virtuous procrastination. It's when you decide not to do something for a while for a good reason. And so what this is doing is it's saying, don't sign the URL until someone asks for the connection. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that if I leave this open for days, which I do, <laughs> 
that if there's a, uh, an interruption in my network connection that triggers this uh, Twitter stream reconnection to repeat, I get a re-signed URL that's valid again because the original one had expired because it has a, an expiry time in it when it signs it. And so if I didn't have that, my reconnect would fail because I was using an old URL. Mm -hmm. So are you when starting with building a lazy pipeline that you post to run on a single thread, or does it split every part of the pipeline into multiple threads? That is completely under your control. So uh, any operator I'm trying to decide how much information to give now and how much to wait for later. Um, but yes, you know, it's completely under your control of where uh, each stage executes. So uh, callback composition doesn't work so well. Promise and subscriptions have different costs. And uh, yeah, we can go on to values distributed in time. So I had a different analogy in here, and I was, my son was asking me about it, and I explained to him what I was trying to say, and he said, oh, it's like playing cards. So each player has zero more cards, and those are in your hand. You can use them right now. You don't have to wait for them. It's like a vector or a list. But the cards in the deck, you can't use. They may come to you eventually when the dealer gets around to it, but those are distributed in time. Eventually, you could have them locally in a vector or list, but you don't have them now. And as I had started to talk about, the marble diagrams help us describe the types of algorithms that you do when you have multiple, when you have sources that have values distributed in time. So you can think of these values as network packets or even requests. That's worse. Like one of my pet peeves is that I can't start parsing a JSON document coming in from an HTTP connection as soon as the first byte arrives. I do not want to wait. I do not want to make 10 different connections with you know, take 10 and skip 10 or whatever to get the subset of data that is going to adjust for the latencies that I want in my parsing. I want to be able to say, I want all of this data, even if it's megabytes, but as soon as the first byte comes, I'm going to start parsing it and emitting each document element as it arrives. So anyhow, it could be network packets. It could be mouse clicks. It turns out the same algorithms that you would use for network packets or database queries or mouse clicks, they're all the same algorithms. And they all have the same concepts to connect them together. So when you uh, do a subscription, start a subscription, there's a set of rules around how it operates its lifetime. And these are the things that help isolate the user, even the implementer of the operator. It helps isolate the implementer of the operator and the user of the operator from uh, concurrency issues so that you don't have to use uh, mutes, mutuses or anything else. So there's the simplest way to start a subscription. You need a subscriber that's uh, interested in the results that are coming from the observable, and you connect them with subscribe. That subscription starts the work. Unlike a promise future, there is no work until subscribe is called. Nothing's happening. And the observer, observable then loops calling on next on the subscriber with each new value as it is uh, available from, from whatever source we're talking about. And after 
the last value is emitted, there will be either a call to on error with a uh, exception pointer, or there'll be a call to completed with no arguments. And then after the completion, there's an unsubscribe. The subscriber uh, is a composition of an observer and a subscription. The subscription represents the async lifetime of a subscription. So you need an async lifetime because the lifetime of the subscription is not bound to a block in C++. So you have to have some other representation of it. And that's the subscription. And the method that you call to end it is unsubscribe. And what this further provides, this unsubscribe method that on the lifetime object, is the ability to cancel. Because that uh, subscription is also returned from subscribe to whomever called subscribe so that they can interrupt the work at any point. But it is also used inside of algorithms like take to interrupt the work. So if you've been getting mouse move events while a mouse down, down was down, you would use take until mouse up to interrupt the flow of moves and that would be the implementation of a drag method. You would only get mouse moves while the mouse was down. And that requires the ability to stop the work, to unsubscribe. So we've talked about deferring work and we've showed the steps involved in running a subscription, the lifetime of a subscription. So now we'll go on and write an algorithm. Each step in an expression has some input that impacts it and forces some output, which then goes and impacts the next operator. So if we wanted to write something that is already in the STL, but write it for async algorithms, the transform operator, it's more commonly known as MAP in the uh, async libraries that I work with. But it's just essentially allowing you to supply a function that will change the input value into a different value for output. So you would start by taking your uh, selector, the thing that will change the, va the function that will change the value from input to out, and that map function returns a function that takes the observable, the source of values, and then it creates an observable that is the, that will produce the output values. And what gets passed in to create is the subscriber that was passed to the observables subscribe. So this is actually the implementation of subscribe that you're looking at here, and what got passed to it was a subscriber. And so in there, you can get all of the values from in, and every time you get a value from in, you can pass it to out after having run it through the selector. And now you've implemented transform. You just do the same thing with the error, and the completion events that came from in, and that's it. That is an algorithm for transforming the values with a selector. So if you run that by starting with a range that includes uh, two to two, and transform it from an integer to a string and subscribe to it, then subscribe will be passed the app subscriber which will then call subscribe on the map. Oh, sorry, subscribe on the map was called passing in the app subscriber. And then subscribe on the range was called in passing the map subscriber. And then on next integer two came through and then on next, or long two, and then on next to string two, and then on completed and then on completed and then a lifetime ends. If toString had thrown an exception, then we would have called uh, on error immediately instead of the on completeds. 
and then unsubscribe. And we unsubscribe every subscriber in the chain. So that's an example of how you would create an algorithm. You'll notice again that there's just no synchronization in there. We didn't need to because uh, one of the guarantees for the observer is that no method will be called uh, overlapped in time. So it sees a serialized view of the world. The calls to on next don't overlap. The calls to on air and on completed don't overlap with anything else. So now we'll look at virtuous procrastination. So we've already seen that if we defer, then we're able to delay the signing of the URL until we're actually ready to make the request. And then we make the request. Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I realize I've missed some, something. Uh, we're, you're, you're showing us how to implement something in, in a particular library, right? At the moment, yes. Which library is that? RxCPP. Um, so these things like defer are, are, are things provided by the library? Yes. Yes. Um, I used RxCPP to build this app. Uh, I'm far more interested in the algorithms themselves and the concepts needed to implement them. The specific implementation or even the specific um, uh, contract, uh, not contract, um, uh, representation aren't that important to me. I think these algorithms are the key, and I think that the concepts required to build them are extremely important, just like the STL algorithms and the iterator concepts that are required, or the range concepts that are required to build them. And uh, yeah, so I'm not wed to this implementation, so I'm not spending a lot of time saying RxCPP is the best, even though, I mean, I've spent years on it and I love it. but. I'm more interested in what the algorithms can do for C++, no matter how they're implemented. So uh, here I can map down to the chunks from the body, and then I can do that uh, stream reconnection for the error handling. And this is what we do when we're uh, inside of stream reconnection to do that error handling. It's an operator. So it returns something that takes an observable, a function that takes an observable. And so when it uh, is called with that, it subscribes to that observable and adds a timeout. So if you don't receive any tweets on the stream uh, for 90 seconds, you're supposed to reconnect immediately. So the timeout will stop this stream after it's been silent for 90 seconds. And then when we get an exception, either from the HTTP stack or from the timeout, then we need to figure out how we're going to uh, respond. So in the case that it's an HTTP uh, exception, then this function, Twitter retry after HTTP, returns a timer, essentially, based on the type of the exception that will um, delay the right amount before ending. Uh, if it's the timeout error that was the exception from this timeout, then we return empty because we want to, uh, we want to retry immediately. We don't want to wait uh, after 90 seconds has already gone by without any information before we reconnect. So this implements the, um, the protocol. And uh, if we don't, uh, if it isn't one of these exceptions that we're expecting, then we're going to essentially rethrow the error as the final result. And in that case, um, we'll actually shut down the app, essentially, because we're in a state where we can't uh, reconnect, like there's some basic problem. Yes, Gore? Uh, can you specify the timeout uh, operation? So it passes through whatever comes? To yep. Time, and injects an error into the body system Yes. Okay. Yes, it injects an error if there was uh, 
timeout injection error if there was no on next uh, uh, from the input in the last 90 seconds. Right. Yeah. Chunks is the input to timeout. Right. Chance? Oh, chunks is the input to timeout. And what is tweeter thread in the timeout? Okay. So what is tweet, tweet, tweet thread in the timeout? So when I need to, okay. RxCPP as an implementation tries to take on one of the normal C++ idioms, which is don't be thread safe by default. Don't pessimize for thread safety by default. Make it opt in. And so if I'm working entirely in a GUI and all of my inputs are from my GUI thread because they're all mouse clicks or whatever, then I don't need any synchronization at all until I try to start introducing things like time. And so when I'm trying to synchronize between a thread and a time source, which would be a scheduler, I need to know which scheduler to use. And the effect is, is when I do have a, um, uh, an operator that's taking a thread, a scheduler, what happens is, is that all of the messages, because of this contract that the operators don't have to deal with multiple threads, uh, being, being called for multiple threads, that means that this thing that sets up a request on the tweet thread for a 90 second interval also has to take every on next, on error, on complete that it receives and schedule it through the same scheduler. So that all of my outputs from this entire operator are all coming from the same scheduler. And so you, when you're composing uh, your um, stream with time or when you're composing two different streams, then you have to supply a scheduler that um, ensures that all of the operations are happening in a single uh, strand context, essentially. That's what your scheduler ends up representing as a strand. One question on the uh, bottom line. Mm -hmm. That return statement seems to do nothing except that refer exception doesn't throw an exception. So uh, this appears, the bottom line seems to do nothing because uh, rethrow exception th rethrows the exception, uh, throws the exception. Yeah. So this does throw the exception, but I don't believe that invalidates the exception pointer. So I can still, I, I assume that I can still pass it on. But if it throws an exception, you either return a value or the exception propagates out. So you would never get to that line. Ah, uh, that may be a slide bug. I have to go back to my code and see if I have actually made that bug in real life. Um, but yes, you're right. It, the, um, there is no catch dot 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 here, so it would never end up uh, calling that last line. So this thing, uh, whatever this lambda, the on-air lambda returns, is a new stream that gets subscribed to. And when it completes, repeat will resubscribe to the whole thing. So that's why returning something that is a timer that's going to complete in the future will cause me to wait a while before I restart everything. But this repeat operator is what actually does go all the way up to the defer on the previous slide and re-sign the URL and restart the HTTP request and go on. So virtuous procrastination. We use deferral so that work can be repeated, retried, and shared. Uh, and we're going to start looking at sharing pretty soon now. So I'd already started talking about this, the opt-in thread safety. So I'm passing in these threads into these operators that I built for this app uh, so that I can parse tweets on a different thread than I'm handling tweets, the parsed tweets on. And what that first one did was it just created a stream of tweets that had already been parsed. Uh, so the first line is actually the request that we were just looking at with the defer in it. And then the second line is a parser that breaks out all the words and gets the text out of the tweet and all this stuff. And then we share that. So 
this uh, each of the actions, actions is an array, and I'm not showing any of the actions yet, but I will soon. Each of the actions starts with tweets as a source, and what it produces is a function that will update the model based on what it just saw in the tweet that it received. So I can have one stream, well, we'll see that soon. But basically, I take all of those functions here and I merge them onto the main thread so that the model is only ever being updated from the main thread. And I update the model merely by running the function that was passed to me on the model and producing a new model. Scan is like reduce or accumulate, except that it produces a new value every time it's changed as output instead of waiting until the end to produce the final value. And so this lets me get a stream. This is what models is. It's a stream of models, and I produce a new one every time there's a change to the model. But that could be way too frequent. So I really only want to sample the most recent model every 200 milliseconds on the main thread. Because I don't really need to update my UI more than every 200 milliseconds. And then I want to share my models. Because it turns out I do the same thing with my renderers. That is also an array. And all of my renderers are subscribed to the models. And every time they see a model change, they produce just one region of the display. And so again, I can just comment out one of them, and one of those display items will go away, and the rest will be unaffected. So now we start talking about the Sentiment Web Service, and this is one of the more interesting uh, things that listens to tweets. It's an action. It goes into the array of actions so that it can update the model. Calling a web service takes some time, especially a sentiment web service uh, that's using machine learning to try and extract sentiment from a set of words. And so I buffer tweets for 500 milliseconds into a vector. And then if it's an empty vector, I just discard it. I don't care. If it's not an empty vector, I take that 500 milliseconds worth of tweets and I start using range v3. Why? Because suddenly I have values distributed, distributed in space, not in time. And there's just no reason not to use range v3 if I've got values distributed in space. So this extracts the text from each JSON tweet and builds a vector of strings which then goes into a sentiment request, which has a defer in it and an HTTP request, pretty much like the others that we already looked at, but this one is a post. And it posts a JSON body that contains the uh, array of um, uh, strings for the different tweets. And then what comes back from the sentiment request is a JSON body that is an array of the sentiments. And so again, I can just use range v3 to zip the array of sentiments with the array of strings, uh, of tweets that produce the text. And now I've paired my sentiments with my tweets. And I didn't show the function, that's the, in the dot, dot, dot. This produces a function that updates the model by storing uh, a map in a, in a map from tweet ID to sentiment text. And so I have a map of tweet to sentiment that is produced by the function uh, that I omitted. So uh, this is actually my project in my current team. We're looking at uh, the calls that have been made to this Twitter and element, uh, sentiment analysis service by my application. 
So I built this service to do the Twitter, Twitter analysis, uh, sentiment analysis. And this is the request response to the published web service from that uh, uh, sentiment analysis service. And this is how you build it. It's a GUI graph, but you can put things uh, like uh, execute R script and execute Python script. So it's, you don't have to actually live in the GUI if you don't want to. But in the end, you can publish a web service from this directly, which is what I did, and then call it. So we talked about the defaults uh, to be non-thread safe and how you specify thread safe schedulers when you're dealing with multiple streams or when you're dealing with time. So how do we adapt? into the algorithm library. So these slides are showing how I adapted libcurl. Curl multi-perform is what I used so that I could multiplex. Um, all the calls to curl have to be made from one thread and completion, yeah. So this is the main loop. What you'll notice perhaps is that this is a create of an observable, which means that this is the implementation of the subscribe method. So the subscribe method is doing a while loop and doing the multi-perform and reading the results. And it's the results that actually get passed out as messages from the observable. Oh dear, what have I done? All right, so the other half of this, oh, uh, actually it's important to say that I subscribe on the HTTP thread. That's what makes sure that I have a thread dedicated to that while loop. So subscribe on says that when someone subscribes to me, I will forward that subscription to, a, uh, to this scheduler. And this scheduler is a single thread scheduler, not a pool or anything. And uh, that means that this subscribe implementation can be a while loop. It can be blocking and just own that thread. And that's what's going on here. So the subscribe loop owns the thread, but we can hook into it based on those on next calls. And that's what we end up doing. If I wanna create a request, the way I do that is I try to get onto the thread. And the way I get onto the thread is I take the worker that was created, I take only one of its on next calls, and then I tap into that to do a side effect. And the side effect is I'm gonna ignore whatever the message is because I don't care. All I'm trying to do is create a new curl instance, uh, request instance, and push it into the multi handle but this lets me do it on that thread that's owned by that subscribe. I do the same thing for unsubscribe. When someone tells me to stop working on a, a particular request, I wait essentially for the next on next call that uh, arrives from the subscriber loop. And then I just remove and clean up. Ex can I explain the the tap. So tap is purely a side effect. It is a function that, uh, it is an operator that takes a full observer contract. So you can tap on next, or you can tap on error, or you can tap on completed. But all of the lambdas you pass in return void effectively. None of the results of these lambdas get used. So they don't affect the stream at all. All it's here for is to allow you to provide side effects from the stream. I have a question. Uh, I don't know if you're going to explain later, but how, how do the messages travel from the curl thread to, let's say, the GUI thread or whoever? Mm -hmm. So in this case, that's just a function call 
to on next in the middle? Yeah. That's going on during this while loop. So when that what that on next call calls is that tap lambda. Yeah. First it called on next on it went from the worker to the take. Yeah. The take said I'll call but now I've called my one so now I'm going to cancel this whole stream. So it just takes one on next, yeah. and then the on next runs the body of the lambda. Uh, yeah, the part I, I understood where what I'm trying to figure is all these on next calls are happening in the curl thread. Right? Yeah. And at some point, you want to send a message to another thread so the on next chain can continue in another thread. Or no? Yes. Uh, that is true. I'm trying to figure out where in the slides I can show that piece of code. I'm not sure if I have that precise well, piece of code in the slides. But essentially, that. you know, the um, one of the message one of the callbacks that is return that you pass to um, uh, libcurl is the one that receives a chunk of data. <coughs> and that produces an on next call on a completely different stream than this. Mm -hmm. This is the control stream just for controlling the requests being added to or removed from curl. Yeah. And this completely different stream is created to actually emit the results of the HTTP request. And that's a different callback that you register with libcurl. Mm -hmm. And in that callback, it forwards and on next into that stream. And then in a previous slide, when I was doing the connection, there was the defer, and then there was a, uh, a, the chunks. I was mapping out the chunks. That's my uh, copy, my handle to the, that stream that's being fed by libcurl with the chunks. And then after that, there was a merge. The merge is a multi-input, uh, has multiple streams as input, and so it has to have a coordination, a, a, a scheduler. And I put a scheduler in there, the tweet thread. And so that meant that all the libcurl thread was doing when it would call back with a chunk is scheduling that chunk onto the tweet thread so that it would then get emitted from the merge on the tweet thread. So the, the merge operation is then the one that is kind of thread safe aware, like, I mean, you have to do some synchronization there to make sure. If I, if I put in an, uh, the default scheduler, which is not synchronized, then you would start getting uh, asynchrony bugs, like you'd get I race see. conditions and crashes. But I put a scheduler that's thread aware, and so I, I get good behavior. So yeah, this is an example of how you would adapt a library. I did something fairly similar for adapting the networking TS to uh, to Rx to show in the lightning talk last night. This one involved a polling loop. Thankfully, the uh, networking, networking TS one does not. Um, yeah. So now we're going to talk a little bit about algorithmic transcendence. Algorithms win all. So in RxCPP, we have a few algorithms. And I have links to uh, marbles.com where I can, which has these interactive marble diagrams on them, and links to Reactive IO when I can't. They have static marble diagrams on them and text describing them. And it's, it, it can be kind of like, it can feel kind of like the STL, where there's just, you never knew there were this many things you could do, uh, building blocks that you could have to deal with things in an async world. And all the ones that are green, that are accented, those are all the ones that I use to build this app. And there's another page of them. And this isn't a complete set. There's more uh, that could be implemented. But the nice thing is, is that Nearly all of these implementations of Rx on all of these different languages have a very similar set of algorithms. And that can be incredibly powerful because 
you can use the algorithms to solve a problem once and then just port them. So this was a Stack Overflow question that I answered a while ago. And it described a situation and I came up with an Rx solution. And then this was an excerpt from the Twitter stream describing what you would get when you connected to their API. And it turned out that it was really the same problem. <laughs> they were both the same problems. And the person that wanted the answer on Stack Overflow wanted it in C Sharp, but I wanted it in C++ for the Twitter app. Not much difference. Does anyone want me to step through this? I c I'm happy to, if anyone would like it. Yeah? All right. So let's step through it. So I'm going to start with my chunks that are coming out of the HTTP request. And I'm going to do a concat map of those chunks split by end of line and iterated over. So what I've done is I've taken a block of text that might have multiple embedded new lines in it. And I've split it so that now I have an array of things. And it's essentially chunk of text, new line, chunk of text, new line, chunk of text as an array. And then I tell iterate to take that array and make it an observable. And so now I get an on next for each of the things in the array. Concat map says when I get uh, past an iterate, I have to finish the subscription, complete uh, uh, emitting all of the chunks of that array before I subscribe to the next one. And so that helps keep everything serialized so that I get the chunks coming out in the same order that they went in. Then I filter out the ones that are empty. Any empty strings, I don't care about. And then again, I go through the share idiom because I need to, a couple of things to subscribe to the strings that are coming out. The first thing that subscribes to the strings is closes. Is end of tweet just checks to see if the string uh, ends in a carriage in the line in the um, delimiter essentially. So it's just checking to see if the delimiter is at the end of the string. And so now I have a stream of signals for when I've hit the end of a line. I also can, can uh, now I can go back and get strings again, but this time I'm going to build a new observable lifetime, an observable sequence with a start and an end that starts right after a previous one closed and ends at the next close. So I'm now building one or more strings that end in a new line, but within a particular subscription, there will only be one line, but it may be multiple strings to make up that line. So I have line windows. And then I take the line windows and I sum them. They're strings. I use the plus operator in sum. Sum is a reduce, so it does not produce any intermediate results. When that window of, uh, that represents one line, multiple strings making up one line, when that window terminates, the result will come out as a single string that represents that line. And that's it. I've now parsed. Yes, Gore. Yeah. Chunks, they are uneven. Yes. Exactly. That's why I'm doing this. Yes. That's the whole purpose of these things, is because I never know where the chunks are being cut from a packet standpoint, from a network packet standpoint. So I could have multiple lines in a single chunk, or I could have chunks, uh, sorry, lines split across chunks. 
where part of it is in one and part of it is in the next. And these, just using these algorithms, I have completely resolved that into just lines. So we took a look at all the algorithms available and we took a look at all the languages that have those algorithms implemented. And then we showed how translatable you can get from one language to another. So going through what we covered so far, we have primitives, are too primitive. We had some ways of handling tweets, whether it be callbacks or promises or subscriptions. We have the flow of a subscription. We have an example of writing an algorithm. We have virtuous procrastination for deferring work until we're ready to do it. We have opt-in thread safety so that we don't do the overhead of thread safety unless we actually need it. We can adapt existing async sources that aren't already RXified. And we can use the same algorithms across a whole bunch of environments and, li and uh, languages. I would love to see a REST service library that lets you use RX expressions to handle requests or make requests. Same thing for HTTP in general. More bindings for UX libraries so that you can compose um, mouse events and other UX with your network requests, etc. Naturally, with these algorithms. Um, <clears throat> yeah, bindings for ASIO or networking TS, which I now have a start on. I haven't updated this to match. And uh, I've started work on RxCPP v3. All of this code that I've showed you in RxCPP, it compiles all the way back to Visual Studio uh, 2013. <laughs> so uh, C++ 11. And uh, I've started experimenting with what it might look like uh, if I could use uh, C++ 14 in that repo. And now I'm going to have to start thinking about what 17 will do to it. Um, I'd love to see the algorithms and the concepts standardized. I don't, again, care that much about the, stand, the implementation. But I think that these algorithms provide a much better way of representing these types of problems that we all deal with, whether it be UX or network or database, all these asynchronous sources. Just being able to compose them with a few algorithms, I think, has vastly better surface for users to both look at and write than directly writing the, with the primit primitives. And yeah, it would be great if the networking TS, for example, had a read that returned an observable or some such concept implementation so that we could just have these algorithms automatically. One of the things I noticed in the workshop was that um, the networking TS has things on the socket like read until. It's baked in, thank you. It's baked in uh, these, um, a small, you know, very limited algorithm into a read function overload in order to cover some of the common scenarios that you might need an algorithm for, rather than just exposing a concept surface that you can build an algorithm set for outside of it. So I'd love to see that uh, added in the future. So a coworker at Microsoft, Eric, he spent a lot of time with me helping me with this presentation. Um, and of course, Niall had done the original uh, uh, presentation with an app that inspired me. And Aaron made the first prototype of ArcCPP years ago that I then picked up and started working on. 
and I'm very happy with the contributors I have right now. There's a set of resources here that you can go to uh, that'll have different sorts of information that can give more depth or uh, access to um, cover any interest that you have in this stuff. Um, I also added a slide for the Lightning Talks uh, slide Earls that I had done this week. So I do have some more slides um, that are uh, that I put after the complete, just in case. Um, but I would be happy to just take questions if there's a lot of questions. So, I don't know if it's in one of your extra slides, but I would, I would like to know a little bit more of how you glue this with the UI. Um, Interesting. No, I don't have any slides on the UX um, because I was working from uh, a diff uh, the other side, but I could actually. So. Oh, that's the wrong one. But it's the only one. This is the one. All right, so if I was going to look at, here's an example. So this is one of the renderers. Let's see if I can get a shorter one. Yeah, that's a good short one. So this one's just rendering the frame weight rate in the top corner, which may not be the best one to show, but it's short. So I'm pushing back into this array of renderers that I'm going to compose into the um, uh, main thread. And frames is, uh, frames is telling me when I need to render. So in my main loop, when I'm pumping the uh, SDL uh, event queue, I will push into frames a signal saying, I'm in my rendering loop. I'm in an instance of my rendering loop. Please redraw the UI. So that frames is shared. So each of the renderers starts by looking at the frames, combines it with the latest model and the take at one helper just means that I only take the model out of the tuple that with latest from returns, I ignore the frame type because it's only there as a signal for when I need the model. So I take that model at each frame and then I can, uh, uh, well, that's just doing a check for thread safety. And then this is using I am GUI uh, to begin a window and draw the text for the frame. And once I have all of my renderers, I just merge them together and subscribe to them. If I have a, this one isn't too long, but it's only rendering the controls. Can I do better? Yeah, so this is the very fast moving recent tweets on the right hand side that we were seeing before. And so again, we, I mean, it's the same pattern. We're just using frames to get the latest model. And then once we have the latest model, we open that window and we start pulling things like the URL to display and the total number of tweets to, that have been uh, uh, received to display. And then we start doing a simple little algorithm to figure out how often to render a new tweet at the top of that window. We want to keep it pretty close to real time, but the one in the middle that has the filter on it, 
just every time a new block of tweets come in, all of them immediately get displayed. And so sometimes there's tweets that you just never see at all. They're, they just come in at the begin with at the, off the bottom. And so this little algorithm just makes sure that I'm doing, uh, you know, maybe one uh, tweet per frame to catch up to the current moment. And that way I can actually see all of them scrolling through, even with a high rate of speed. So I don't know if this helps at all for figuring out how the rendering is done. Yeah, a little bit. I was just interested, like, when I was saying UI is not only the rendering, like, also, like, I guess you have, like, different events, like, that change your processing stream, right? Like, what you showed in the slides before, it's kind of like a static pipeline. But then, I don't know, you, you press a button and part of this pipeline changes. Ah, uh, event handling. Okay. Yeah, for example. So I am GUI is uh, a little different because the event handling in I am GUI isn't actually a callback. It's, uh, it's more like an if statement around the button. When you draw it, it tells you whether it's been clicked. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> I'm actually, it's one of the things about um, this type of library in an imperative language, you can be incredibly dirty. So I'm really using the existing I am GUI patterns of having like static global variables mm -hmm. that hold state. Yeah. That's like a temporary, that's not the way I would like to do it, but I was going for a low impedance uh, diff change for the I am GUI stuff. So I don't have uh, events for that. What I have done is I've produced events for um, I've produced events for the settings changes that go on, because I actually store the settings so that I, when it comes back, I, I can restore. So for instance, I can actually change this so that we're looking for now what this did is this rewrote the settings file with a different query. We're no longer using the sample of all English words, uh, all English tweets. We're now filtering for a set of words. And so all of the tweets are gonna have love or hate in them, one or the other. And you'll see how the number of tweets in this window is climbing. I don't get just 1,000 tweets a minute when I move into the filter mode. I get up to 3,000 tweets a minute. And so right now we're over 2,000 in this minute already. So you can see the spike in the graph in the volume of tweets that I'm getting <laughs> because I filtered it down to this. But that whole settings causing the um, uh, request to be restarted with a new URL that's entirely reactive uh, RxCPP. So when I detected the UX change during the rendering pass, I emitted the update into uh, a subject, uh, a stream. And so then the, um, when I'm doing that Twitter stream connection, it's actually getting the URL from this stream. And so every time I change it, the settings, then that goes and reconnects to the new URL. And so that signal I'm actually using RxCPP to manage. Yeah, so we're up to 2,300 a, a minute now. 2,300 tweets? 2,300 tweets a minute. Is there, is there like, are you ever hitting limits with their API or? So they do all the limiting for me. <laughs> but is there, is there a point where your program becomes faster than it needs to be because you can only process so much because your API, API only feeds you so much? Um, so uh, is there a point where it becomes faster than it needs to be? Um, I suppose, you know, it is faster than it needs to be. There's not a lot of CPU going into it, even with uh, the volume that we have right now. So I could definitely handle more if they would send me more. But, uh, you know, I, I actually, on my Comcast, one, my first month of just running this every night, all night, just to make sure it was stable, 
Uh, by the end of the month, I started getting emails from Comcast saying I was overdoing my budget limits for the week, month and that I'd start getting uh, rate limited by Comcast. So it ended up being a lot of data over the course of a month. I've had this thing running long enough at one point so that the total number of tweets that it had processed uh, got over 10 million. So, and that's, you know, with, on this laptop with, you know, lid closed and sleep for hours and then come back, it's, it's able to recover. Yes, Gore. I heard that Netflix or iOS developers would be training them in RX ways. Is this true? So, uh, Gore is asking if it's true that uh, when you join Netflix, you get retrained uh, on RX. And I have uh, spent some time with some Netflix engineers that were working on RX Java. And yes. Yeah, they use it, uh, they use RX Java and build RX Java. They implement it and use it for all their services. And they use uh, RxJS in their clients. And so basically from end to end, they just have RX expressions to build their entire service. Yes, Gore. So what is currently missing, uh, missing in the standard to support Rx? So we have a lot of talk about executors. Um, they're very similar to the schedulers that are in Rx. However, in Rx, one of the things that proves to be extremely uh, important for the algorithms is to be able to have a sense of time, what now is, that is associated with the scheduler that you're passing that time to. You want this to occur at this time. If I have a scheduler that also has a, um, is telling me what the current point in the timeline is, I can do interesting things like have um, video and audio scrubbing that's controlled by the scheduler. Or I can do interesting things like um, uh, test, where I pass a test scheduler that when a production expression that would take six seconds or 30 seconds to complete in the real time could actually complete in milliseconds because when it asked to run something five seconds later, it would just get run immediately but be told that it was five seconds later by that scheduler implementation providing its own sense of time. So the scheduler can actually just skip time and tell them that it's later than it is and with this virtual sense of time, you get to do a lot of interesting um, uh, expressions that are isolated from how much real time is actually passed. Um, so that was one thing in the standard that seems to be missing. Um, well, I mean, we don't even have executors yet, but the proposals I've seen don't have that binding. Another thing, uh, Yeah, you just need these additional concepts. You need to know about um, uh, a source of values. You need an asynchronous, life, asynchronous lifetime for the lifetime of, the, of that source of values. You need uh, the receiver that will absorb that source of values. These concepts, uh, we have to have them in order to build each of the algorithms. Like there was that whole list of algorithms and something like take, if it can't cancel, the stream above it, there's really no point in a take thing, something that will stop the stream at a signal. You can only implement that if you can stop the stream. So you have to have an asynchronous lifetime with a cancellation option. Uh, when you want to build uh, this deferral stuff, like you want to build repeat or retry, you have to be able to have an error signal or a completion signal to trigger that. So it's the concepts that matter, and we need implementations of the concepts in order to build these algorithms. Is that it? One more.
Um, in the uh, uh, slide that you had with the code, you had a uh, concatenation of events that ended in uh, publish and I think counting. And the, the ones below that didn't have that. Right. Uh, so I had one slide where uh, there was a stream that ended in uh, was it this one? Previous to this? Oh, it was the C plus. Oh, okay. Let's go see. Yeah, that one. Okay. So the first one ends in publish and ref count, and the other three don't need that? Ah, uh, the first one ends in publish and ref count, and the other three don't need that. So, yes, uh, it's true that they don't need that because none of the other ones is being shared. So, the only reason I'm doing that is so that I can have multiple subscriptions to the same source and not re... Uh, uh, like, theoretically, if this wasn't shared and this wasn't shared, then when I subscribe to it twice, I would actually make two twi twi Twitter, uh, tweet, um, connections to Twitter. <laughs> like, it would go all the way up the chain. I'd make two separate connections, and they'd each be doing their own thing. They wouldn't coordinate at all. It would be a mess. So by sharing the chunks, uh, I make sure that there's only one connection. And by sharing this, I make sure that I only do this parsing once. Yes, Gore? So publish is followed by ref count, and does it make sense to have one without the other? Uh, so a lot of the other libraries have actually decided that this should be called share. And you shouldn't see publish and ref count. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Uh, I understand like questions like this, like what does this mean? This is actually, <coughs> excuse me, publish and ref count are actually uh, a pretty weird com uh, composition. What you get out of publish is technically an observable, but it's actually an observable that even when you subscribe to it, doesn't start. <laughs> and so there are two options to follow publish. You can either follow publish with ref count, which means if it's bouncing from zero ref count to one ref count on a call to subscribe, it will start the stream. And if it's bouncing from one to zero on an unsubscribe, then it will unsubscribe the connection. And the, the thing that's going on here is that Publish is serving as a multicaster. And so because I'm connecting to it with multiple interested parties, it becomes harder to figure out what the lifetime is. So ref count implements a ref count lifetime over Publish. And there's another operator called connect forever that right here, if I put connect forever here, this whole thing would start immediately before I even subscribed these guys to it. And so, <clears throat> and so uh, those are your two options for composition with publish. Publish is just, uh, you know, intending to multicast, and then the lifetime policy is the next operator and you really can't use it without inserting a lifetime policy after publish. It just doesn't produce anything. Yes, Gore. So uh, when uh, we have closes pipeline, right, the, the, the very first one, so that is the point where stream will become live, right? They will connect and start issuing stream at the same point. You mean uh, after the flat map on the lines? Closes, closes equals streams. It's the oh, closes. Uh, one, one. E yeah, here. So, is the stream become live? <coughs> live at semicolon? Or at no. No. One. So, if you'll notice, there's no subscribe anywhere in this page. Without a subscribe, nothing happens, unless you put a connect forever in there, and that is another way to subscribe. But 
we haven't mentioned subscribe. And in fact, if you look through the uh, main CPP of this app, there's really only one call to subscribe. And it's the one that was right after that uh, uh, frame rate renderer. And it actually takes all the renderers and iterates over them and subscribes to them in a merge. So that they're all subscribed to at the same time running in parallel, interleaved on the main thread. Um, that single subscribe subscribes all the renderers. The renderers all subscribe the models. The models all subscribe the actions. The actions all subscribe the, re the re request. And so that single subscribe is actually the point at which something happens. Nothing's happened up to that other than construction of the graph. Yes, Gore. So, just to reiterate a little bit, essentially, you declared your describe your entire system. Yep. And then at some point at the very end, you keep it as a go. Yep. Yes, I, uh, to repeat what Gore said, at, I constructed the entire application, connected it all together, and then at the very end I called subscribed, and that's what said go. Yep. Did this framework bring some debugging tools to plot the graph? <laughs> Do these frameworks bring debugging tools? Oh, yeah. So first there's template debugging. That's fun. This, much like range v3, will greatly benefit from concepts. Um, and then secondly, once you get it to compile, the goal, th there's, there's two possible um, uh, sources of errors. Bugs in the library and places where you, no, there's a whole bunch more bugs, I'm sorry. I was just thinking of like crashes. Um, places where you didn't introduce the correct uh, concurrency injection and you had multiple streams that were coming from different threads and you get a crash. Um, so crashes aren't that hard to debug. You pretty much can see, oh, at this point uh, there was an access violation and I go look at that point in my stream uh, and sure, you know, you have an error stack like this. I should mention that too. Um, <clears throat> with RxCPP, because these, uh, I, another one of the principles of C++ that I tried to keep was that there are no virtual functions unless you ask for them. So that means that your expression actually resolves to a giant object template uh, declaration. Like every operator is in there with all of its argument, template arguments, all the way up the stream until you put in an as dynamic. And there is, and that's how you break it down into smaller stacks uh, on your debug output, is you insert uh, as dynamic to create these virtual function uh, interruptions in the type so that you get smaller types. So that's one off to the side. The other off to the side, I mean, to continue on the main topic of debugging, um, Usually the way that you debug when your assembly of the algorithm doesn't do what you thought it should, you use printfs in your lambdas, <laughs> <laughs> you use uh, breakpoints in your lambdas. Basically, you shouldn't need to look inside uh, the algorithms any more than you do the STL ones. It's really about do I actually get here when I think I'm going to get here? And is that string a value that I think it should be? And that's the level of debugging that you're usually doing with these, just like the STL algorithms, unless there's a bug in my library. I would imagine that like, you, you can use the tap that you showed before to kind of add probes. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Yes, I do use tap to add probes. That is correct mm -hmm. uh, when I'm debugging. Um, uh, and, you know, you can, there's, three ways that you can probe, you can, or, or two ways that you can probe. There's tap, which lets you probe for on next, um, on error and on complete. And then there's finally, which lets you uh, tap the unsubscribe. Yeah. So finally we'll get you unsubscribe and tap will get you the other three. The only thing that there isn't an easy way to tap uh, is subscribe itself. So for that, you would need to build an operator, one of those operators, and in the body of the subscribe, 
do the tap and then subscribe to the input. Hey, Gor. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't even know where to begin, Gore. How, how would I count the number of allocations on in C Sharp from the uh, number of allocations? So one of the problems that I have in RxCPP right now that I want to fix when I go for C++14 or 17 is that a lot of these operators end up uh, having state that they need to maintain. And that state really, today, the only easy way to maintain it on the asynchronous lifetime that it needs to be is to just do a separate make shared. And I hate all of those separate make shareds in each operator. I know, I hate it. So I know. So. Probably. What I'm hoping to get to is to have an arena allocator associated with the async lifetime so that I don't have to make um, shared pointer allocations. I can just do arena allocations and they will end automatically on the end of the uh, async lifetime. Uh, why, for example, it's not a couple people of individual operators and string essentially a people of a whole bunch of... Mm -hmm. oh. Because unlike coroutines, as you might know, I don't get to interrupt the uh, the unwind semantics, right? So as soon as I run past a subscribe, it tear it, you know it'll run out of that block out of that scope, and everything there will tear down. So I have to build an async lifetime that's separated from the block. Since I, I asked earlier, at mm -hmm. what point this whole thing starts? Mm -hmm. right? Yep. It's the subscribe where this becomes an issue. After, subscribe is non-blocking, and it also doesn't uh, hold the block. You know, the compiler doesn't hold the block for me. So when I call subscribe and it returns immediately, and then I fall out of that block and it deallocates the objects, they would all just go away. They would destruct. I need to keep them alive after I've exited their frame. And that means I have to have some sort of heap allocation. Yes? I guess that is what Tori is trying to get to. That since you're compiling all this stuff into a huge type, yeah. you know all the states you need at compile time. So you should allocate at the end instead of for every single operation. Ah. So uh, the point is, is that I could know all of this at compile time and I wouldn't need to allocate again. That's definitely not true. <clears throat> because I can actually um, see if I can think of a good example of this. An event can come in, say a mouse down. And then in the flat map for that event, I create dynamically a new stream that represents mouse moves. And then I say I attack an operator onto that dynamically that says take until mouse up. It's not, comp I, I know the graph at compile time, but I don't have an instance, at, you know, I. Yes, I, I see. So what's stopping you from building an instance after you know the entire graph and the instance contains all the required states? Unless I'm missing something fundamental that prevents you from doing that. So maybe drag drop isn't the best case because I wouldn't have more than one of those going at the same time. But if I had web requests going, it's not like I would know how many web, web requests I was going to create, right? It's a dynamic thing. I, I have the type of the thing, but I don't know how many instances of it there are going to be. Hello, Gore. Continue on the subject. So I think there could be some heavy heavy medium where it is per activated pipeline you have potentially Unless, of course, you're in the coroutine, then it can be uh, on, the, on the frame of, of the coroutine. Yes. So essentially, it's one heap allocation per pipeline, lifetime of which escapes the current function. Right. So, so that is my idea. the idea is that you could end up making it so that there was one allocation per essentially asynchronous lifetime, a single asynchronous lifetime, a single subscribe. You would be able to allocate its entire stack. That escapes 
function. Right. One thing you, that escapes the current function. Um, one thing that you need to remember here is that some of these operators introduce new lifetimes. Hidden from you, there are hidden subscribes, like in a merge or a concat. And what that means is, is that the lifetimes may be smaller than you think. You may only have one subscribe in your app, but that doesn't mean there would be one heap allocation even if we had that optimization. It would still mean that you would get up to your concat and then there'd be one heap allocation for each of the subscribes it does and it would get up to a merge and there'd be one heap allocation for each of the subscribes it does, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a whole bunch of async lifetimes in a single pipeline. And so you would have to at least allocate, and that's why I'm thinking arena allocator per lifetime. I'm thinking that's the best way to compose this. Make sense? <laughs> Are we done? All right, we're done.